good evening good afternoon good morning to all i think i will hand over to our first presenter e e chu thanks for the uh, interest in this session the feasibility session my name is g e from uh, Waseda university japan and i am the presenter today uh, representing uh, three co-authors um, uh, we have been working on a model intercomparison project in Japan, JMIP, and it, in, it includes five uh, Japan IAM teams. And it is also the project that led us to the topic we will share today, the can Japan transition to carbon neutrality, the perceived visibility based on expert perspectives. And uh, uh, we would like to clarify the goal, the climate goal we are discussing, whether it is positive or not today. And uh, it is Japan's national goal, the pledge of achieving carbon uh, greenhouse gas neutrality within Japan by 2050. And uh, whether it is, it, this is feasible or not, it is not only a topic that attracts the interest of us IAM community, it is also more generally. And uh, this is an ambitious goal and the direction of decarbonization transition towards it is highly contested. And we can hear these invisible voices. And according to a recent survey conducted by Asahi Weekly, uh, around the, among the 300 respondents uh, from all age groups, 41.8 of them thought that the zero emission goal is impossible or extremely difficult to be achieved. And not only the individuals, another survey targeting the companies also conducted recently among the um, 11,000 companies, 17.9 uh, of them report that it is impossible to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And another 43.4 said that it is difficult to do so. And all these invisible voices call for uh, an approach, uh, a relatively robust, transparent, and scientific approach to assess feasibility of one specific climate goal. And IAMs can give binary answers. If the model, uh, mainly the optimization models, have a solution, then the pathway or the scenario is feasible. But we all notice that the uh, IAMs cannot fully cover the dimensions such as the complexity of social reality, the innovation dynamics, the social acceptance, the process of climate action implementation, the behaviors of all actors, I am, I am have the difficulties to cover these dimensions and sometimes it can be these non technological non economical barriers that matters most. So what we aim at is we are trying to establish a multi dimensional assessment approach of feasibility and apply it to Japan's case, we want to understand the most important barriers to Japan uh, achieving its carbon neutrality goal. And uh, this is an ongoing work. Uh, we have finished um, convenience sampling. We have created our survey instrument. And we have finished um, the expert screening. And we are now in the middle of semi-structured interviews. Um, we have interviewed 49 uh, experts in our list of around 120 in all. And the results shown today are preliminary fundings. And I, I would like to apologize that we actually discussed a lot among us causes um, considering the possibility of our interviewees in the current audience, or they may check the records later. To avoid uh, possible biases, we would not show the results and the results were shown uh, in this way. For example, we have the, um, the frequency of the liability and the feasibility and we have the results of uh, the differences of desirability between experts from the government affiliation group and experts from the industry uh, stakeholder groups. If our interviewees saw this first, they, this may definitely cause biases. So we would like to apologize that we cannot show a lot of our results, but we are very happy to share how we uh, developed our survey instrument and what kind of results or findings we can reach. And uh, before I introduce our way or our approach of feasibility assessment, I would like to walk you through the previous literature, although not fruitful on the assessment of feasibility. We will also show some typical works. 
And we have the uh, first in SR 1.5, the feasibility is assessed at option level and the indicators are grouped into six dimensions, economic, technological, uh, environmental, ecological, geographical, institutional, and social, cultural. And uh, um, uh, this uh, in SR 1.5, it touched upon the questions of whether it is possible to limit global warming to a specific climate goal, but still at option level, not the uh, system visibility. And this work, um, yeah, the work from the team of our next presenter uh, assessed the system visibility across scenarios. And uh, also is an indicator approach. They uh, categorized the level of visibility concern for each indicator. Uh, in this multiple uh, dimensions based on the thresholds from literature and available uh, empirical data. And these indicators are again uh, aggregated within or across the dimensions. And there are also histo uh, hist uh, historical precedent approach. Uh, for example, um, in this figure, uh, uh, in this area with a back, uh, color of blue as background. This is a feasibility zone where multiple presidents can be observed. And also this area, this yellow area, rare presidents, and this red area, no presidents. And uh, also um, the expert assessment approach. In expert assessment approach, these experts are asked to assess um, levels, uh, variables, scenarios, and uh, for example, in this work, the experts are the experts, and uh, the IEMs assess the same variables, and uh, they also found that the uh, IEMs and experts align for the for the VAO scenarios, but not uh, uh, but not for the scenarios with these. Uh, gray color as backgrounds, the ones uh, with more nuclear and uh, conventional technologies plus CCS. And uh, we also um, uh, benefited from the wisdom of political policy uh, feasibility researchers. It is a quite large community, but it is not necessarily targeting the climate policy goals. In this work that explores the concepts of general political feasibility, it separates the hot constraints and soft constraints. Hot constraints are the constraints always being constraints. They rule out in a binary role. And uh, the soft constraints make the outcomes comparatively less feasible. And for example, if we apply this scalar or probabilistic feasibility to assess the feasibility of achieving a climate goal, uh, it will be given the same set of soft constraints x the barriers, the respondents will perceive different sets of best actions phi, namely how barriers may occur, may remain or disappear, the likelihood and impact of these barriers, and the leading to different perceived outcomes and also different judgment of if these perceived outcomes can meet with OSTAR a specific climate goal in, in this study, uh, the carbon neutrality in Japan by 2050. And uh, based on this, we defined uh, feasibility. And uh, we, uh, feasibility is affected by the constraints or barriers and how feasibility is affected by constraints is often not binary, but scalar or probabilistic. And we consider both uh, hard and soft constraints in this study. And compared to feasibility, the desirability is a more normative evaluation. And uh, the motivation of other people uh, can be probably a motivation, a mo uh, motivation constraint to assess feasibility, but her own motivation is the desirability. And also regarding the definition of barriers, um, the more absence of barriers of one option, the more feasible it becomes. And the risks of each barrier is determined by its likelihood of acting or becoming as a barrier and impact on hindering uh, the feasibility of achieving carbon neutrality. And these are the examples from hot constraints to soft constraints. And these are some examples of barriers. 
Um, in our interview sheet, uh, it has four parts. Uh, we first ask desirability, what is the most desirable level of emission induction goal? And then we ask feasibility, to what extent do you think the goals would be feasible? And the next part we asked uh, in our convenience sampling, we asked it in an open-ended way, uh, totally growth, uh, brainstorming style, what kind of uh, barriers or innovators can you be thinking about uh, regarding the, phys uh, regarding the uh, feasibility of decarbonization. And at last, we, asked, we collect the uh, information of this expert. And uh, um, we contacted 10 experts in the convenience sampling to collect the options for barriers and enablers. And we do this by we, we three courses discussed first and uh, uh, supplemented by the what we get the ideas from the uh, uh, convenience and polling. We consider the structures of technological, economical, political, and cultural barriers. We also uh, consider the structures of actors. And we also need to keep the description in the same way. And we try to uh, figure keep the uh, description in different in multiple language uh, the same for future works and uh, here we have our the final list of the 22 barriers and uh, we uh, use this uh, list to the semi-structured interviews and this is how we screen the experts from IPCC also list from web of science and also from the uh, funding database in Japan. And here are some results. Uh, we have the results, uh, desirability and feasibility of experts by affiliation, by discipline, by working years, and by modelers or non-modelers. And also the barriers can be mapped by uh, X as probability and Y as impact. And also by, cal uh, by calculating the risks of each barrier, we can have what is the the top three uh, barriers that hindering the feasibility of uh, Japan achieving its carbon neutrality by 2050, and some um, uh, some uh, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have a lot a lot of time. Uh, and yes, some uh, cluster of these barriers. Uh, we try to rename these uh, barriers, and as a wrap up. Are mitigation pathways towards carbon neutrality feasible? And the models are not enough. The answer is also not binary. IAMs can be supplemented by the experts' insight. And based on expert perception, we assessed these uh, probabilis probabilistic constraints, and we separated desirability from feasibility. And uh, we are also considering to uh, try to uh, link these IAM-based uh, uh, studies with our perceived uh, feasibilities. And then we think uh, dialogue, structure dialogues is very important. And uh, yes, that's all of the, uh, all of the, uh, this works here. Okay. Thank you. So with this, uh, I will go to the next presenter, Silvia Piante. Uh, she would be presenting on exploring demand side mitigation, comparing historical dietary changes and IM scenarios. Thank so um, thank you. Um, and thank you for the previous presentation. Very interesting. So I'm um, a researcher at, at the RFF CMCC European Institute on Economics and the Environment. And I will present joint work with Elena Brushin from IASA, who's also in the audience, and Valentina Bosetti, also from EIE. And um, this project focuses uh, a bit more on the feasibility of demand, uh, of changes in, demand, in the demand side. And um, it looks specifically at um, dietary changes. Um, this is super um, preliminary work. So any comments and feedback are, are extremely welcome. Uh, and the motivation of this study comes a bit from uh, this increased attention on the potentialities of mitigation in, in the demand sector, and in particular, the food system is an important uh, contributor to global emissions. And according to the recent estimates, it's responsible for one third of anthropogenic emissions. And in particular, within the food system, uh, the livestock production is a great um, 
great uh, contributor to global emissions, and it's actually responsible for 60% of emissions uh, from the agricultural sector. And so there's in, there, is, there is increasing attention how, on how dietary shifts, and in particular substituting some meat with more plant-based diets can um, contribute to global mitigation. And however, there is still little research um, trying to understand how feasible are the dietary shifts, but also in particular, how feasible they are under different conditions. And again, here there is no intention to give a binary answer to what is feasible or not feasible, but just highlight uh, cross-regional differences and, and predictors of, of feasibility. So enablers and challengers, challenges to, to feasibility of changes in this sector. So uh, integrated assessment models account very well for land and technological constraints, but they incorporate a bit less social and behavioral factors shaping um, changes in the land sector. And so what we hope to do here is to bridge evidence from social and behavioral science, uh, so from empirical analysis and experiments with scenario data. And this is interesting not only to, uh, because of the emission implication of, of the food system and the livestock sector, but also all the other environmental impacts of, of this sector concerning biodiversity, ecosystems, and, and freshwater resources. Um, there is wide evidence in the literature of a, a relationship between economic development and demand, with meat demand increasing um, when GDP increases. Uh, and in scenarios, indeed, livestock consumption is mostly modeled as a function of GDP, population, and prices, with some assumption on price elasticity. Um, however, different literature show that the social and cultural factors can be very important in shaping dietary choices. And these factors can be education, but also religions on, on consumption of different types of meat, religious norms on consumption of different types of meats, and other social norms. And there are different works uh, uh, from different disciplines, and there is also a recent working paper by Giacomo Falchetta and co-authors looking at this topic on uh, focusing on sub-Saharan Africa. So we think it's important and interesting to look not only at the economic, but also the social and cultural factors that can shape uh, changes in, in this sector. And also uh, this factor can be somehow leveraged by policy interventions. And so this is a uh, further um, reason why we think this can be interesting to look at. Uh, and this is just a basic theoretical model that we built. Uh, just to show the, the factors that we try to incorporate uh, in our model. And so we, here we see meat, meat uh, consumption choices as a function of both income and meat prices, so these economic factors, but also other social and cultural factors, including, including religious norms on food consumption, urbanization trends, uh, uh, education and gender equality, and all these social cultural factors can change uh, social norms on meat consumption or also the interpretation and availability of scientific knowledge on health impacts of meat consumption. And all these things can shape meat preferences, uh, preferences for different types of meat, uh, interact with um, price uh, and income to shape meat consumption choice. Uh, so the method that we use here is first we analyze historical trends of meat demand and, com and then we compare them with um, livestock trend present in livestock consumption trend present in mitigation scenarios uh, produced by uh, IEMs and we build different models. Our preferred model is a model with theoretically selected predictors with also country fixed effects but we also run different robustness checks using lasso variable selection models. Um, and then we use this uh, model based, built based on historical data to project trends of meat demand in the future. And we also use projections of country fixed effect used by previous um, research uh, by Crespo Quaresma and others. And then we compare our projected trends based on this empirical based model with trend presence in um, IAM scenarios. And we combine different data sets, both historical data from different sources and projections available also from different sources and in particular from the Wittgenstein Center. And so we use data on meat consumption, data on GDP, and importantly here we allow for some non-linearity in the relationship between GDP and meat consumption. And actually we do find an um, inversely shaped relationship between income um, GDP per capita and meat consumption. So it looks like reaching when a certain level of GDP is reached, uh, meat consumption tends to go down. Then we have data on population, urbanization rate, and urbanization rate growth. 
education and some uh, measures of gender equality, which has been also shown to uh, be correlated with lower meat consumption. So we build our model uh, based on historical data, build projections, use this empirically based model, and then compare it with scenarios. And this is just a simple model also based on um, a regression of livestock consumption on these different predictors with country fixed effects. And here we can see confirmation of this inversely shaped relationship with GDP because the, um, the um, square terms of GDP is actually a negative coefficient. And then we do find that um, the growth of uh, the urban share of the population, uh, graduate education and uh, reduced gender gap actually decrease uh, meat consumption. And therefore, we might expect that in the future, with increasing urbanization and uh, gender equality and education, this might also lead to reduce meat consumption. Um, and this is just a graph to uh, give you an idea of a snapshot, a snapshot of the present. And here you can see uh, consumption of different uh, animal proteins, so not only meat, uh, but also poultry, eggs, and, and um, and cheese and milk. And here you can see values for different, across different regions uh, for different meat types ranging from, the, uh, from beef in brown, which is the one with highest emissions um, and, and going down towards eggs, let's say. And just uh, this graph is just to show you the wide uh, variation across different regions. For instance, there's a strong preference for pork in China. And also, if you look at Latin America, the proportion of, of beef consumes over total uh, animal protein is very high. So we think it's interesting to take, take, think, take into account this um, uh, available empirical data also when building projections. And this, this is just super preliminary, preliminary work. Here we try to compare historical data, and these are these uh, red lines, with some scenarios from Engage. And here, the first thing to point out is that scenarios just model overall um, animal protein consumption, so they do not differentiate between different types of meat. Um, and there is wide variations among, uh, wide variation among scenarios. Um, um, in their, in their evaluation or, or estimation of, of livestock uh, consumption trends. And some scenarios uh, are more comparable than others to, to empirical data. And in particular, Rem uh, Reman Pai uh, is the one closest to, to empirical data here. And also another thing to look at is that in general, there is always a monotonic increase uh, in meat consumption. And perhaps if we try to um, build these models using different empirical based predictors, we might actually find different uh, um, projected trends. And this is uh, another idea, uh, another graph, just to give you an idea of empirical trends. And here you can see, for instance, that beef consumption, which is the uh, brown line here, actually um, flattens and starts to decrease in many regions. And there are different um, trends in different regions, but there is no, the, the, let's say, there is a lack of this continuous increase in meat demand also because an individual cannot consume more and more meat until uh, infinite values. Um, so the idea that we have is just to combine this emp empirical data with scenario data and try to um, make them communicate a bit more. Um, and these are some first uh, experiments with the projections. So these are projections based on the empirical model that I showed you before with the coefficient plot. And these are projections for different SSPs for, in this case, just for, for different regions. And actually we, we can see that there is, in our projections, especially for SSP one, uh, two and five, there is not a projected uh, monotonic increase in, in, uh, in levels of consumption, but actually in some region, we, uh, we also find a decrease. So as I said, this is just uh, a first experiment and we will work uh, significantly more on this, but just to sum up, we try to incorporate insights from social and behavioral science to understand not only the economic, but also the social, social and cultural drivers of dietary changes, and also their implication for um, decarbon decarbonization strategies in general. And we try to compare model scenarios uh, with the historical data and um, our projections. And we also uh, try to pay attention to uh, cross-regional differences because they are really significant. 
And looking at the uh, model scenario data, we find different vari uh, significant variation across uh, models in reporting levels of consumption. And models are very sophisticated in their incorporation of technical and economic constraints, but perhaps there is room to incorporate also some insight from social and behavioral science on other uh, constraints and enabler of dietary changes. So the next steps um, that we plan is first to run some robustness checks of our predictions, and then we hope to incorporate cross-regional variation in emission intensity of different types of meat and see so the implication of different projections for different types of meat, what they mean. And finally, we also hope to be able to look at the role of policy, finding, for instance, uh, some policies in the past that were successful in, um, in, in reducing meat consumption and try to model their impact in, in the future. So I'm done. And uh, with this picture thank that you. I took, I think I should stop. Thank there. you, Sylvia. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Sylvia. I think you have a question from Wilhelm in the chat uh, about uh, clarifying um, between the education and meat consumption in many of the developing countries. So how can education have a negative effect while GDP per capita have a positive effect? So. Yeah, thanks for the question. So I think uh, when we just look at the correlation between meat consumption and GDP or education and GDP, we do find these trends. But when we run a model where we put as predictors at the same time, both education and GDP, we find the impact of education when controlling for, for GDP or GDP when controlling for education. So I think that with our model, we're able to, to incorporate these, uh, these different effects. Uh, but let me know if I did not uh, answer. Yeah, I, yeah, I think they are asking if it was a negative effect. Why right? education had a negative effect when yes. GDP had a positive. Exactly. Effect. Okay. Yes. And I think maybe I'll just ask one question about the gender equality. When you said if there's gender equality, the meat consumption is less. So is it based from developed countries or developing countries or both? Or? This is across all countries. And again, that the model we showed is a model with country fixed effects. So it somehow con controls for country uh, specific time invariant uh, unobserved factors. But when we run models without country fixed effects, we found very similar results. Um, and the idea that we have is that probably when uh, women start to work more, maybe they have less time <laughs> to cook very complex meat, meat dishes, or they might also um, have different intrinsic preferences or, uh, or something like that. Yeah. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, I think you have more questions coming up in the chat, so please go ahead and answer them. Now we move on to our next presenter, Isabella, who would be from PBL, who would be presenting on bioenergy potentials under environmental and social constraints. Go ahead, Isabella. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm Isabella. And today I'm going to present uh, our ongoing work on bioenergy potentials under social ecological constraints. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of myself, Facilis, and Atlev. Um, then I'm going to start with just a little context, but nothing that uh, probably everybody here um, doesn't already know. But um, in the community, um, we have been uh, in quite a, a lot of discussion about bioenergy deployment and how um, in low carbon scenarios, we see it a lot coming in, in the results of our models uh, for decarbonizing, uh, especially the hard to bait sectors and for providing negative emissions uh, when coupled with carbon capture and storage. And we have been uh, seeing those results and we have been questioning um, how feasible they actually are. Um, and, then, uh, and, and then sometimes we, we kind of get a lot of critique on, on the amount of bioenergy that we see um, coming out in our scenarios. Um, so this is a complex and controversial uh, topic. And um, there are a lot of questions regarding the sustainability of, of those potentials, right? Um, in what regards, for example, food, food security and the competition with food crops. Um, and how it relates also with land, land use and land use changes, direct and indirect. 
and also water requirements, fertilizers. So there are a lot of um, issues regarding the large scale deployment of bioenergy. And then um, this kind of motivated us to uh, dig into a little bit more, uh, what are the potentials actually? And, and we see that uh, in the past years throughout the literature, we see a, a very large range of the estimated potentials um, and here I'm showing the, some of uh, literature review for 2050. And um, this is in terms of primary bioenergy. Um, and then we see how we have uh, those less optimistic and those most optimistic um, results. So uh, ranging from like lower than 100 uh, exajoules per year and reaching like almost 700. So we have this large uh, range of estimated potentials. And then what we see in our research is that the higher estimates that usually involve uh, more uh, land available for bioenergy production. So then we have a, a larger share of abandoned agricultural lands. And we also see a lot in terms of yields improvements that um, allow for this estimations to reach um, those higher numbers. And then we see that uh, when we dig into the lower estimates, we usually um, find that they try to acknowledge um, ecological and biophysical concerns that are usually raised uh, when we talk about bioenergy. And then we also see that uh, methods and assumptions, they vary widely when calculating those potentials. And then here in the figure, for example, we can see that uh, in terms of feedstocks, for example, so some studies, they will include only dedicated energy crops, others will include residues, and others will only uh, calculate residues, for example. And then we see that it's not a very consistent methodology um, throughout the literature. So um, the motivation for, for this work, it actually started um, in the collaboration and engage project um, with uh, the feasibility work that is being led by Elena and, the, and then also Sylvia. So we started working on this to provide a reasonable threshold for the bioenergy dimension there. Um, and then we, we just decided to, okay, let's dig a little further into this topic and let's try to come up with a comprehensive and consistent assessment of primary bioenergy potentials, since we have seen that throughout the literature, this is not very consistent. Um, and then we tried um, addressing the concerns that were raised regarding the deployment of, of bioenergy in such a large scale, and to try to investigate which elements were most important uh, and that could potentially affect um, the feasibility of, of uh, such potentials. Or um, after seeing David's uh, talk yesterday, uh, the plausibility of the outcome of, of such potentials. Um, so then how we, we started doing this, uh, and as I said before, this is ongoing work, but uh, we're using the image model uh, to determine the especially explicit potentials from both dedicated energy crops and residues. And here we include agricultural, forestry, residues, and municipal solid waste. Um, and we try to do that across different constraints. Um, so we first assess the constraints individually and how they affect the potentials. And then we move on to a combination of different constraints and we try to build uh, different storylines and different scenarios based on uh, that specific combination of constraints. Um, so here just uh, outline the, all the constraints that we use. So we start up from a SSB2 baseline. And then uh, in principle, we allow for 10% of agricultural land available for bioenergy production. And then we move on to the constraints of, for example, a food first principle. So no agricultural land is available. We also apply no improvement of yields. So we consider constant yields after 2020. Um, protection of biomes. So no savannas allowed anymore and 50% of scrublands are available. 
Um, we also limit emissions from land use change, and this is based on the work from facilities on the emission factors um, for, for land use change. Um, we also work on residues availability, so how much residues have to be left on the field for um, ecological services. We work on the water stress dimension, uh, biodiversity protection as well, and here we apply a half-earth map. And we also try to assess the social, economic, and political feasibility uh, based on the work from Rural et al. about uh, the national feasibility scores. So, um, as I said, those are the individual constraints and we apply them in individually, but then we try to combine different, uh, different sets of constraints so that we can come up with uh, different scenarios. Um, so we came up with these four scenarios and it would be interesting to hear uh, from you guys. Um, if you think we should have more or if it makes sense. But um, so our initial idea was that we would, um, for example, address a concern from the community that, okay, so we need to minimize land use change. We don't want land use change. Um, so we came up with a scenario that focuses on land use change. Um, and then we tried uh, addressing um, the ecological dimension and in contrast to the human dimension. And finally, the socio-ecological services scenario that is just a combination of all constraints. So it's as um, strict as we could be uh, in the sets of constraints that we're using. Um, and then I'm gonna show some of the results for this. So these are the bioenergy potentials and how they, um, how they were estimated after we applied the constraints individually. So this is for 2050, and we also have them for 2100. And then we see that uh, by 2100, we reach kind of around 600 exajoules per year if we consider a higher availability of land. But when we start applying other constraints, uh, we see how this varies. And uh, what is interesting to see here is how, um, so the two constraints that had uh, the most impact on the estimations were the food first principle. And here I'm just highlighting that this actually image default um, and the emission factors from land use change. Uh, they were both uh, the constraints that had most impact. And then we see that um, applying those constraints individually, we get to around um, 240, 200, 245 exajoules more and less per year in 2100. Um, and then moving on to the scenarios. So what we see is that, uh, well, ex as expected, the social ecological services had the um, lowest uh, potentials. So lower than 85%, I think, lower than 90% at least uh, by 2100. And that uh, the minimized uh, land use change had the highest uh, potentials, but they were even so on the lower side of the literature research, I would say, like something around 180 by 2100. Um, and how these varies across uh, the different scenarios that we had. And what is in also interesting to notice is how um, residues play an important role uh, when we see the, um, the most restrictive scenario that we have. So it's over 90% of the estimated potentials come from residues. Um, and then here on the right side, uh, we try to, to make a, a comparison between um, the estimated potentials and the area, the land available. For, uh, for producing such, uh, such potentials, for reaching such potentials. And what was interesting when we plotted this uh, was to see how for the ecological services, we actually had a higher um, amount of area. So um, then we tried under, to understand why um, that, what, what was driving that outcome. And um, what we saw was that uh, for the ecological services, and here we're not applying a food first principle, 
um, we had a higher availability of low productivity grasslands. Uh, and this is why uh, we had a, a more area requirements to reach uh, that amount uh, of bioenergy production. Um, and then comparing the human services with the minimized look, so they had um, more and less uh, similar uh, potentials, but then um, very different um, area requirements outcomes. And then we see here how, um, for example, for the human services, we observed a higher productivity in the lands that were available. And then uh, we were, it had a, a, a lower requirement and area to reach a similar um, bioenergy potential. And then, um, of course, there is a combination of effects uh, in each scenario and how uh, the combination of constraints um, uh, dro drove the outcomes that we see, but I'm just point pointing out some of them. Um, and then uh, just for like some, just so that you can see how it looks like geographically. So um, what is interesting to point out is that indeed for the ecoservices, we see more uh, land availability and how, for example, when we apply um, the human services constraints and the social political feasibility scores, how uh, some of the lands in Eurasia, for example, they are, um, uh, they are not available anymore. So um, yeah, it, it was also interesting to see where this land is available and how it changes across the different uh, scenarios that we uh, came up with. Um, and then just some conclusions, but pretty much um, things that I already said, um, that of all the constraints, the food first principle and the emission factors for land use change were the ones that indiv individually had um, the most impact over the estimation of potentials. Um, and how of all the four scenarios, the minimized land use change had the highest uh, of the estimated potential, so reaching uh, over 180 exajoules per year in 2100, and how, uh, of course, the most restrict restrictive assumptions in the socio-ecological services scenario resulted in the lowest uh, calculated potentials, and how uh, most of that potential was coming from residues. And so residues, they are indeed expected in our scenarios to play an important role uh, in bioenergy supply, especially when we um, consider the ecological constraints. Um, and then just to put this into perspective, um, we see how in the special report on 1.5 degree scenarios database, um, most uh, of, of the scenarios that meet the Paris Agreement uh, use in 2100 from like 100 to 20 uh, to, to 270 exajoules um, and how the lower end of this range in our results, of course, and then applying uh, the somewhat uh, stricter constraints, um, how those uh, are, can be classified then as feasible. Uh, so like, so all the results like under um, 200, 190 exajoules uh, in, the, in the SR 1.5 database. And then uh, from here, so in terms of future work, um, what we're, we're gonna do in the future now is we're gonna try to model uh, climate impacts and how climate impacts would influence also by energy deployment and how they would influence the constraints that we've set and the different potentials that we would get if we would also include um, climate impacts uh, across all of the constraints. Um, so that's it. Yeah, thank you, Isabella. Um, I would ask the audience if they have any questions to please use the chat. Uh, uh, till then, I just have one question. So from uh, the scenarios perspective, is trade between countries or regions considered in each of the scenarios? If yes, uh, how much of a role does it play? Yes, it is considered. 
but I don't really know uh, how much of a role it is does it play because we didn't assess um, the trade itself. We do we do have it. It, it is in the model, so it is inside the model, but we didn't uh, we didn't evaluate uh, how much how much was actually being traded. But we it, it's interesting. We could do it. Yeah. And, okay. and maybe I get okay. better with you. Yeah. So thank you. I'll just switch over to Clarissa for the last presentation of our session. Uh, I am IAM analysis of biomass co-processing opportunities in the refinery sector. Please go ahead, Clarissa. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Clarissa. This is, those are my colleagues. We are from Synergia Laboratory in the uh, energy planning program in the Uni Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and I'll be presenting our work which focuses on biomass processing in petroleum refineries. So here's a brief agenda of the topics I'll be covering. And as an introduction to our work, I'd like to point out that deep decarbonization scenarios show that a reduction in oil consumption must happen during the following decades in order for the world to be able to reach the objectives of the Paris Agreement. So I'll be bringing here some figures from the International Energy Agency. This is a work uh, where they show a pathway for achieving net zero CO2 emissions in the global energy sector uh, in 2050. I'll be bringing those figures as an example of the facts I'm talking about in this introdu introductory section. So we can see here uh, uh, the reduction in oil production. And this, of course, means the reduction in refineries operations as well. This is a result of different uh, factors, such as a priority for electrification, especially for road transport, which is shown by many scenarios. And also uh, the employment of biofuels and other kinds of fuels, especially for hard to abate sectors, which is also shown by some models. Here, uh, this figure from the same uh, source shows then fossil fuels reducing its part their participation and other fuels uh, gain importance. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we know that some volume of oil will still be needed, uh, especially for hard to abate sectors, such as aviation, where we know that biofuels, for instance, are already certified, however, in blends with conventional oil, which is already, which is still important. Also conventional oil is an important feedstock for the petrochemical industry. So here again, a figure from the same source, showing us in red that oil is still important for the transport sector, also for this non-combustion sector, which includes petrochemical, the chemical industry. Uh, it is also important to uh, point out that biofuels or other kinds of uh, alternative fuels haven't reached production scale to fully replace the oil, as we know. So as a conclusion from this introductory part, we can say that there is an opportunity for the refinery sector, even in the energy transition, because it will still be needed for producing some volume of oil, and it can and it must adapt uh, for new kinds of fuels. So uh, the main focus of our work is one form of adaption, which is biomass processing in petroleum refineries. Uh, so uh, how can this happen? A refinery is a very complex installation with several different process units. And uh, it is known that different kinds of biomass feedstocks, such as lignocellulosic biomass, oily crops, sugary crops, waste, residues, can go through different process producing uh, bioliquids, which can be fed one or more than one, than one uh, refinery unit, meaning that this is technically feasible. And uh, what we have in the end are the liquid products we know of, however, with the content of biomass. Uh, so uh, some of those pathways, not all of them, but some of them are adequate for what we call co-processing, uh, which means the joint feeding in these units of the bioliquid uh, with conventional fuel. In, uh, so both of them with conventional oil, oil sorry. So both of, of them being fed simultaneously. I hear list which are the most common uh, co-processing pathways. They usually uh, involve bio oils, which is the name given for uh, the, the liquid we obtain from 
pyrolysis of lignocellulosic cellulosic biomass and vegetable oils, which are obtained from oily crops. Uh, of course, this kind of strategy involves uh, advantages such as the uh, using of existing infrastructure, utilities, logistics, the fact that it requires less capital costs than investing in a completely new installation, and the potential it shows to expand production of biofuels. Also, very importantly, it helps avoiding the stranding of refinery assets because we keep using uh, assets from the uh, refinery sector. Challenges involve uh, logistics from the field up until the refinery, availability of biomass, and also seasonality of biomass production. So in order to better evaluate uh, this kind of strategy, we started an implementation of biomass processing in our national model, BLUES model. So BLUES is a national model for Brazil. We here have a brief description. It is important to point out that it considers Brazil divided in five regions. However, uh, only four of them uh, have refineries in Brazil. So this is why my results will only show four regions. So uh, we do not have a complete description of each refinery in our models, but we do have a description for each global region. So we know uh, the refining capacity in each one of the four uh, regions of interest. And we've been using CESAR, which is a satellite model, which is capable of uh, better simulating in detail uh, the refinery process. So uh, CESAR uses the, the information of uh, global capacity in its region and is able to calculate and give loads, our main model, the production of each uh, fuel. Uh, what we did here was to consider that the global capacity in each region is uh, altered by the fact that we will be also inputting some kind of uh, liquid from biomass. Uh, so this is our main uh, strategy. And we did a first case study. So this case study uh, considers uh, scenarios for achieving 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming by 2050. And we divided it in two cases, one uh, without biomass processing, uh, meaning that refineries only can operate in their conventional fashion with uh, conventional oil. And the second case with biomass processing. And from all those routes that are available and that shown some uh, slides ago, we already included vegetable oils and bio oils with and without uh, the joint feeding of conventional oil. So here's our results. The little dots show the results for uh, without biomass processing, only fossil uh, refineries only able to operate with fossil oil. And the bars show the case where the model can choose uh, uh, for using uh, also biomass processing. Uh, key points here, uh, we can see that biomass processing showed up in 2050 in the Southeast and South of Brazil, which are the regions uh, with larger refining capacity, larger demand and where biofeed stock is more available. So it makes sense that the, the model would choose that. Uh, also, biomass penetration is low, and I mean that it is low because we don't see it in other regions, we don't see it in 2030, for instance, and also uh, refinery utilization here, uh, what we are seeing is refinery utilization, uh, it is below 50%, for instance. So uh, we, we can say that this happens because we are looking at uh, an ambitious scenario of global warming of 1.5 degrees. And the model uh, will prefer to uh, produce biofuels outside the, the refinery because this is not linked to oil production. And because some of our pathways outside the refinery also include a carbon capture, which might be preferable here. Uh, nevertheless, even with this low penetration, we can see that this strategy helps avoiding asset stranding because uh, when, we, uh, when the refinery cannot assess biomass processing, we can see here by the dots that the refinery utilization is even lower. So using biomass might be enabling uh, one refinery, two refineries, we can, we can uh, in future work do uh, a more detailed calculation on that, but it, it is enabling some assets to keep uh, operating. So here, as final remarks to, to our work, biomass processing, uh, 
in petroleum refineries is an alternative for the sector to adapt for a reduced demand of conventional oil and also helps avoiding the stranding of refineries assets. Uh, we already included in our model uh, the processing of bio oils and vegetable oils with or without conventional oil. Our case study has shown that uh, biomass processing has a role in, in the mitigation scenario uh, aiming at 1.5 degrees. Uh, we could see that uh, we can avoid stranding of some assets. And also, importantly, we have several other routes, as I've shown some slides ago, for biomass processing. And in future work, we will be implementing those routes in order to, to make a, a more complete evaluation of the role of biomass processing in mitigation pathways. So I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Clarissa. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, between short term and long term. So, can uh, uh, is it feasible to have the biomass processing in the short and medium term? Uh, if not, what are the challenges? Uh, okay, thank you. This is a, a very interesting question. Uh, as I've shown, we have several diff several different possibilities of kinds of biomass and roots that can be processed. Uh, one of them, which we already included in our model, uh, which is the processing of vegetable oils, is a mature technology and is already being used in some refineries in Europe that are starting to do this kind of uh, operation. So uh, looking at this side, uh, it is possible in the short term. It is very possible in the short term. Of course, we do have challenges, especially associated with more complex pathways. So I think it is a strategy that can be used with many other strategies uh, in order for us to achieve our objectives. Okay, Sylvia, please go ahead. Thank you. So thanks everyone for the great presentations. I have a um, question for Gigi or Yi. Sorry for mispronouncing your name. Um, I, I think your work is super interesting and I really look forward to seeing the results of your survey. Um, one question that I have is perhaps on, uh, on uh, the definition of desirability. So my question is, do you just ask about the desirability of specific climate targets or the feasibility of specific climate targets? Or uh, because when with Elena and others, we were thinking about this distinction between desirability and feasibility, we were always thinking, uh, maybe there's also an issue with the desirability of, of impacts. So if we have a lot of uh, bioenergy, this might have positive climate impacts, but negative biodiversity impacts. So a uh, general question of how you incorporate desirability in your work. Thanks. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that's a very interesting comment. Yeah, we, are, we actually have thought about it. We have discussed about it. So first, I would like to and so how the desirability is asked. And actually it is quite simple, it's quite straightforward. We ask to, uh, is 80% uh, of reduction desirable? Is 100% of reduction desirable? Is 90%, yeah. We, we ask them to, to choose from one of these multiple options. And the one you actually mentioned, uh, for example, the nuanced thinking about uh, desirability. Um, if the experts have something to uh, to supplement, uh, we ask. We actually have the 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 place for for some open ended uh, feedbacks. And also, uh, the one you mentioned, for example, um, uh, if if this barrier disappeared, the, the, then this can be more desirable. And another thing we're thinking about is desirability of whom? Because regarding the feasibility question, uh, uh, for example, it is feasible for, for whom? For stakeholders or for citizens or for private sectors or for policymakers and for the desirability. And also we have these kind of problems. But since uh, in this case, we are focusing on the assessment of feasibility and we just, uh, the one, the only, the, the most important, the key point is we need to separate desirability from feasibility. So, so far we think um, this, this straightforward, uh, how desirable you think the desirable level and plus if you have some nuanced thinking, plus let us know and we can analyze the tests 
And currently, we think that can be enough. Yeah, yeah, but definitely, that's a very interesting point. Uh, anyone else has questions to the presenters? If not, I can also do a follow-up question to E on the kind of experts you have questioned till now. Uh, are they mainly modelers or they are a combination of modelers, policymakers, and how have their opinion when you compare it to the desirability versus feasibility differed? Um, yes, uh, there is a standard. We want to keep the uh, screening standard, the criterion very clean. So uh, we have the standards uh, from the uh, regarding the, the papers, the count of papers from our web of science regarding the, the project uh, for funding basis and also uh, IPCC author list. And we, we have this standard and we need to make it very clean. And based on the current uh, feedbacks we have collected, uh, respondents we collected, and uh, the distribution of, uh, for example, uh, industry stakeholders or non-industry stakeholders, the expert is, the discipline of this expert is more working group one, working, working group two, or working group three, or for example, it's uh, it, it, it has some, some distributions and we can somehow analyze the results and uh, now it is kind of quite uh, preliminary and uh, as, uh, as I explained it is difficult it, it, I cannot uh, show the results to you now but yeah somehow later after we finish the interview I will be very glad to share the updates uh, yeah keep uh, keep uh, all the people interested uh, updated. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for being here. Thank you. And I think we will be concluding for the day.